festival. It gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce James Otteson, uh, indeed, uh, to see him after a year of isolation. Jim is the John T. Ryan Jr. Professor of Business Ethics and Rex and Alice A. Martin Faculty Director of the University of Notre Dame Deloitte Center for Ethical Leadership and the Mendoza School of Business at the University of Notre Dame. He's also the author, author of, most recently, aside from this book uh, he's going to talk about today, The End of Socialism, which is published by Cambridge in 2014, Actual Ethics, published by Cambridge in 2006, and Adam Smith's Marketplace of Life, also published by Cambridge in 2002. Uh, he is, curiously, I suppose, the closest thing we have to a franchise uh, at Cambridge. Uh, in scholarly publishing, it's not unusual for um, uh, scholars to publish many books with many different publishers, but uh, I suppose Jim is unusual in that his books are all with Cambridge and we're delighted to have him uh, as part of our livery. I would like to add also that um, he contains multitudes, as the great poet Walt Whitman said, for he's a philosophy PhD, teaching in a business school, and writing on economics. So that's, that's a pretty versatile human being. With that, I'll hand it over to Jim. It's Thank you very Jim. much, Robert, uh, for that introduction. And I do sometimes feel like a bit of an interloper, uh, but it's a great pleasure and honor to be with you. And thank you, everybody who's joining us for this seminar. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, um, and we will hope that that, uh, that, that works um, so that all of you can see it. Um, but it looks like what I've done here is uh, shared the final, um, the final slide. So let me share the first slide instead. Give me one second here as I do this. Momentarily. There we are, that's the last slide again. Um, there we are. Okay, um, so thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, and pleasure to talk about my book, um, Seven Deadly Economic Sins. Uh, so to begin, let me just ask, um, raise the question, are there such a thing as economic sins? Well, you probably have heard of the seven deadly sins. Uh, I don't know whether you could name them all. Could you name them all? Uh, I won't quiz you. Here they are. Uh, pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Um, now, that's not just a random collection of bad things. Those sins are called deadly sins for a reason. And it's really these two reasons. First of all, they all lead to destruction, damage in our lot uh, or loss in our lives, either our personal lives or our professional lives or both. Um, but in addition to that, and I think this is why they're called deadly sins, it's because we seem to have a certain predilection towards them. Human nature seems to be particularly disposed to those particular sins, and they are dreadfully difficult to actually master. So if you find yourself able to master one or another of them, you probably find yourself indulging another one. It's very hard and probably not even possible to master all of them at the same time. So they are indeed deadly sins. In my book, what I'd like to, what I argue and what I'd like to suggest today is that there might be something like deadly economic sins as well, and they would have some of the same features. Um, now, you might initially be skeptical about this because you might note or have noticed that economists disagree about a lot of things, uh, and that's certainly true. They disagree about what the effects of, um, of the next round of tax increases or decreases will be. They'll disagree about when the next recession will be or what we're supposed to do about it when it happens. But it's also true that they, can, that they agree about lots of things. Um, and in this, I would draw an analogy to medicine. So um, if you think about um, the medical field, there are lots of diseases um, where you might get a range of opinions about how to treat them, even in some cases, whether they're really diseases at all or whether they should be treated at all. Um, but it doesn't follow from that that we shouldn't pay attention to medical expertise. Um, for a lot of the more routine and day-to-day ailments we might face. Um, there is indeed quite a bit of agreement among uh, medical professionals and often the diagnoses and also what to do about the problems are relatively straightforward and there's a consensus. And I think there's something similar um, that something similar holds with economics. So what would these deadly economic sins be? Well, um, they would have the same two features as the, as the deadly sins themselves. Um, first of all, they are fairly widespread. We seem almost intuitively uh, susceptible to believing them, um, yet each of them can lead to waste, to loss, to foregone prosperity. 
Um, and so my argument is, my proposal, and what I'd like to try to at least preliminarily convince you of today is that if we could exorcise them from our thinking, this could actually enable benefit to us, both personally, um, in our social lives, and, and also in public policy. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. Um, and I would note, just by way of introduction, that uh, we have strong feelings about uh, economic, about systems of economics, and of course about uh, specific uh, economic issues. Take, for example, the question of capitalism and socialism. As Robert mentioned, uh, for full disclosure, I myself have been uh, have joined this discussion. There's the uh, the cover of my book, The End of Socialism, which came out several years ago. Um, but think about these questions that I list there. Um, should we increase the minimum wage? Should we have fair trade? Should we have uh, free trade? Should we place tariffs on foreign goods? Um, is inequality bad for the economy? And why exactly is inequality bad for the economy? How much inequality? Are billionaires bad for the economy? Now, if you look at those questions, my guess is, I don't know you, of course, but my guess is that you probably have opinions about those, uh, about those issues. Um, and you may even have very strongly held positions about those issues. And of course, even economists are divided on at least some of these issues. So it's uh, relatively easy to find economists who might be on one side or another of these issues. Um, so is it even possible that economics can help? Well, I think economics can help. Um, I'd like to try to convince you of that today. Um, but first, let me ask you to think about a different series of questions. So these are not economic questions, um, but I want you to think not just about the content of the questions I'm about to list here, but also about how you would go about answering them if you didn't know the answer already. So just consider these relatively randomly selected questions. So are the interior angles of a triangle equal to two right angles? What's the limit of one over n to the x as x approaches infinity? How far is the earth from the sun? When did Caesar cross the Rubicon? Is there life on other planets? Um, now, how many of those do you already know the answer to? Uh, I'll give you a second to think about it, uh, but my real, uh, I'll give you the answer, um, but I, the answers to them, but I would like you to think for a second about how we would go about answering them if we didn't know, already know the answers. Um, so take the first two. The first two are really able to be decided um, once you understand the relevant rules of mathematics. So the first one is, a, is in geometry. The second one is something um, like sort of pre-calculus. Um, but if you understand the rules of geometry or you understand the rules of mathematics, you're gonna be able to demonstrate the answer to those questions um, decisively. That is, there won't be any disagreement about it. The only disagreement might come about if we don't know what the relevant rules are. Um, look at the next three questions. How far is the earth from the sun? When did Caesar cross the Rubicon? Is there life on other planets? Um, those questions too have a relatively straightforward way of figuring them out if we don't already know. Um, they're empirical questions and the short answer is we have to go out and look. Um, if we want to know how far the earth is from the sun, we measure it and we figure out methods to measure it. And once we've done so, um, then the answers are clear and there's no controversy about them. So those are the answers there. I put a question mark after number five. Um, I think that's still, um, that's still undecided. Um, but if we wanna know whether there's life on other planets, well, then the way to find out is to go look. But once we know, then there's no controversy anymore. Compare that by contrast to questions about economics. There seems to be recurring controversy. And I think it's not just because we don't know the answers to particular factual questions, but also because it, we're, there's no clear consensus about how to go about figuring out what the right answer to them is. Now, here's something that's a, a bit curious about economic matters. And this is something I have noted as a philosopher coming into economics and now teaching in, in a business school. Many people have very strongly held uh, opinions about economic matters, um, but few people have actually studied economics. That's strange, isn't it? Um, so I list for you another series of questions. Um, and my guess is that just about everybody listening today and probably everybody you know will have an opinion about these questions. Maybe again, a strongly held opinion. Um, should we raise the, raise the minimum wage? Should we decrease corporate tax uh, rates? Is immigration a net positive or negative on the economy? What's the likely, what are the likely effects of tariffs? What are the likely effects of government subsidizing solar energy production? So almost all of us have opinions about these things, but here's what's interesting about it. I would say before we develop an opinion about them, we should know at least something about what the numerous economic studies that have been conducted on each of these questions would tell us. 
Now that doesn't mean that the answers to those questions, that those five questions listed there, actually tell us whether we should do them or not. And that's a very important distinction. So the likely effects of increasing the minimum wage, that's an, that's an empirical question. That's something we can study. We can look at places that have done so and compare them to other relevant or similar places that have not done so. This will enable us to make predictions about what would happen if we increase the minimum wage. But once we know the empirical facts of it, um, that doesn't necessarily mean or imply that there's any particular thing that we should do. So as I say here, descriptive statements, those are factual statements, don't by themselves entail normative or moral judgments because sometimes we have to make a moral judgment in addition to or given the facts, but the facts themselves are not a moral judgment. So what we should do about any of these cases actually requires some normative or moral or value judgments. And I think that's again, similar to medicine. So I would again, analogize economics and medicine. If you think about medicine, suppose you have an ailment, maybe you, there are three, let's say different routes that you might take to treat the ailment. Each of them is going to have various potential or likely benefits and also potentially potential and likely costs. Well, once you know what all of those costs are, well, what, what's the right level of risk for you to take? Well, the right level of risk for you to take or for any individual to take requires a judgment. And that judgment is not simply given by the facts about what the relative likelihoods of uh, benefits and, and risks are. Um, it requires a normative or a value judgment. And I think that's something similar to economics. So let's turn to economics. How should we decide contested economic matters? Here's my proposal. I think we should recur to something called political economy. Now that term, political economy, is an 18th century term. It was also used in the 19th century and still a bit in the 20th and 21st century. But that term political economy is what Adam Smith and David Hume and James Mill, John Stuart Mill, David Ricardo, many others of the classical, um, um, we now think of them as economists, maybe philosophers, but that's the term they used to describe the inquiry that they were engaging in. And it's really a marriage of these two things. On the one hand, moral philosophy. So what are the moral values we have? What are the moral goals should society, uh, society should seek? And also perhaps what are the problems that we think we ought to try to address in society? That's moral philosophy, but it marries that to the principles of economic reasoning, at least insofar as we can understand them. So what are the likely benefits of taking one course of action or another? What are the likely costs of taking one, um, one course of action or another? And in particular, what are the trade-offs involved? Now keep that word trade-offs in mind for a second. I'm gonna come back to that because that's a very important economic concept of trade-offs. Here's my argument. Political economy suggests that a judgment to proceed, if, we, if there's a proposal, say a policy proposal, raising the minimum wage or decreasing um, corporate tax or whatever it is, if this is a proposal, a judgment to go forward requires both of those. It requires us first to understand what our moral values are, and then it also understands us to have, uh, requires us to have some understanding of the principles of economic reasoning. If that's true, if it requires both, then economics is a part of it. So it's gotta help, but how can it? <clears throat> All right, so how, what, what can economics teach? Well, here I would like to make reference to a very famous British economic, uh, economist named Lionel Robbins. Um, in 1932, he offered this definition of the discipline of economics, and it's become a very famous de uh, definition of the discipline. Robbins says, this economics is the science that studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means, which have alternative uses. Okay, so there are lots of important elements of that definition. Um, human behavior, a relationship between ends and scarce means, and those means have alternative uses. So let me just note a couple of things about that. First of all, scarcity. So the discipline of economics presumes scarcity. In fact, I would go so far as to say if economists will let an interloper like me as a philosopher say something about their discipline, there would be no discipline of economics without the notion of scarcity. And what that means is that there are limits to our resources. We do not have unlimited resources. If, however much wealth a person has, um, there, it's not enough to satisfy all of his or her ends or all of his or her goals. That means that we have to make choices. We can't pursue all the things in life we would like to pursue. We're going to have to choose from among them. And that's imposed on us by the fact of the scarcity of our resources. And by the way, resources doesn't just mean 
money. It can also mean our time. It can mean our human capital. It can mean even things like our love. We can't we don't have unlimited love that we can give to all people, so we have to make choices about that too. So scarcity is a presumption of economics. Second one, and I mentioned this before, trade-offs. Because we have scarce resources, that means that if we put some of our resources in one place, those same resources can't also go to another place. Um, Every decision we make involves a trade-off. It means saying yes to something, but then also no to indefinitely many other things. I mean, just think for a second about one of your most precious resources. One of your most precious resources is your time. Your time is limited. Um, you, there was a certain point at which your time on this earth began, and there is a point, I'm sorry to say, at which it will end. This is true for all of us. No matter how much time there is between the first point and the second point, we cannot increase it. We can't make any more of it. What does that mean? That means that anything you spend, let's say, a year doing is a year that you cannot ever get back in the entire history of the universe. It is gone forever. That's not just a year. That's a month, a week, a day, an hour, a minute. That means that every choice you make about what to do is putting that resource of time to one place that it therefore cannot be spent anywhere else. So every choice we make involves trade-offs. And then finally, if you put those two together, scarcity and trade-offs, what does that imply? That implies that we need to make, we need to have a ranking. In other words, we need to think about what is the most important thing in our lives? What's second most important, third most important, and so on. And then what we want to do is to allocate our scarce resources, first to the first most important thing, second to the second most important thing, and so on down the list. And the reason for that is because we don't want to put resources to a lower ranked value to us, so something that we ourselves think is of lesser importance, at the expense of something that we ourselves think is of greater importance. So putting those three things together, I think you get a sense of what economics is as a discipline. Economics is an attempt, it's a set of tools, a powerful set of tools that enables us to try to make, to try to put our resources, understand our limited resources, understand the trade-offs involved with every choice we make, and then allocate our resources in such a way that enables us to fulfill the most important things we have in life first, second most important second, and so on down the line. So that's really the hard question. And what I would suggest economics as a set of tools enables us to uh, be in a position to, um, to make some headway on is how to decide to allocate our scarce resources, given that our resources are always scarce. But then there's another hard question, can we increase our resources? So I mentioned that we probably can't, uh, I mean, I suppose if we take good care of our health, maybe we can extend our, our time. But if we think about our other resources, our material resources, can we increase our resources so as to enable us to achieve more of our goals? That's a hard question that I think economics can help us with. And let's think about that for a second. Can we increase our resources? Well, let's uh, take a bit of a historical perspective for just a second. Once upon a time, a strange thing happened. Take a look at this graph, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm showing you there is the world gross domestic product over the last 2,000 years. In other words, the total amount of wealth in constant inflation-adjusted dollars over the last 2000 years. That is quite a hockey stick, is it not, ladies and gentlemen? Um, but if you see there, so that goes, all, that goes all the way out to 2019, that's the last date for which uh, we have data. Uh, but you can see there that from one year one to 500, no change, from 500 to 1000, no change, from 1000 to 500, uh, 1500, no change, a couple of blips after that, and then something happened. Well, what happened? Um, let me show you one more graph just to drive the point home a little bit. Um, this is going back even further. So now I'm giving you, again, um, the total amount of wealth produced in the entire world in inflation-adjusted dollars, going back from today all the way back. The blue line goes back to year one. The red line goes back 12,000 years ago. So that's to about the time of when human beings began to engage in agriculture. Um, the, the two lines come from two different economists. The blue line is from Angus Madison, who died about 10 years ago. He should have won the Nobel Prize for this for calculating um, gross domestic product. Now, the difference between this graph and the previous one is in this one, we're dividing it, it's per capita, which means we take the total amount of wealth um, created in the world divided by the number of people alive at the time. 
Angus Madison calculated that back to year one. Brad DeLong, who's a contemporary economist at Berkeley, at the University of California, Berkeley now, calculated it back uh, 12,000 years. Um, the differences between the two lines that you see there, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the differences in the lines here is owing to a slightly different way of calculating. But I think that that's less interesting than this long, low, consistent line in both cases, and then boom, something happened here. And then it began its upward trajectory to today, levels of wealth that are completely unprecedented in the entire history of humanity. So let me emphasize that, ladies and gentlemen, you and I are blessed to be living at a time that has more wealth in real terms than has ever existed in the entire history of humanity. So do you have a theory about what happened? Now, if you're a social scientist looking at a graph like this, what is interesting? Is it interesting what happened between 6,500 and uh, 6,000 BC? No, you know, it, it, between here, no, that's, it's here. What happened? What began to happen here that led to this? Well, maybe you have a theory about it. Um, let me give you what my theory is. And of course, I'm drawing on the work of many other people, but um, let me motivate my answer by asking you to consider this question. Suppose you have something I want. Um, it could be anything, your labor, or maybe I want you to work for me, or it could be um, your love, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we'd like to be partners, um, maybe it's your laptop. Anything that another person has that you might want, there are really two ways to get it, aren't there? So what are the two ways you could get something from somebody else, something you want from somebody else? Um, well, I can uh, almost see the brains turning. You're probably already thinking about the two ways. Well, one way is a not very pleasant way. So one way is you could steal it from somebody. So you could kill somebody and take it from them. You could steal it from them when they're not looking. You could defraud them out of it, a promise to give them money for it to which they agree. Then you get the good or service or land or whatever it is, and then you don't pay them. All of those ways we might call extraction. And all of them involve benefiting one party to the transaction at the expense of the other party to the transaction. That's one way. What's, a what's another way you might get? Well, another way I might get, let's say your laptop from you is to make a proposal to you, make you an offer that you're free to accept or decline. That we might call not extraction, but cooperation. And what's the difference between extraction and cooperation? Well, there are some important differences. Um, cooperation is mutually voluntary. Um, so extraction is things like slavery, theft, colonialism, et cetera. And in fact, if you remember that long, low red line in that graph I showed you, what's one explanation for why wealth never really increased? I mean, you may think of some of the great civilizations of the past. Think of the Egyptian pharaohs and their pyramids, or think of the Roman Empire with its Colosseum and its aqueducts and its roads. Think of the Song Dynasty in China around 1000 AD. Um, it was a massive, um, a massive empire with science and literature, gunpowder. Um, yet throughout all of those periods, no real blip. And I think one of the reasons why is that the way, take the Roman Empire in particular, the way Rome was able to generate or get all of that capital to build the Colosseum, et cetera, was through extraction. They just stole it from other people. That's not increasing the wealth, the net wealth in the world. That's just taking it from other places and piling it up in one place. That's not an overall increase in wealth. In fact, that's a zero, it's what economists call a zero sum exchange. So if I steal your laptop from you, that's plus one laptop for me, but it's minus one laptop for you. Plus one plus minus one is zero, hence a zero sum. It could also be negative sum. If you think about the Roman Empire, they also destroyed a lot of assets, killed people. So it could even be a net loss of resources. But compare that to cooperation. Um, in a mutually voluntary transaction, what we have is a positive sum transaction. What I mean by that is um, if I make you an offer for your laptop and you accept the offer, then I wouldn't have made that offer if I didn't think I would benefit from it. You wouldn't have accepted the offer if you didn't think you would benefit from it. So if we both voluntarily accepted it, that suggests that we both think that it benefited us respectively. So a positive value for you, a positive value for me, that means a positive sum transaction. And I mentioned there, if you look just up, up a little bit higher, um, the cooperation that is involved in a commercial society, Adam Smith said it exceeds all computation. He has an example of, he says, uh, think first, he was writing in the 18th century. He said, think of the 
um, the uh, woolen coat that the common day laborer wears in, in his day in Britain. So it may seem very simple and plain, but in fact, um, it was created by the cooperation of an almost untold number of people. So on the one hand, you might think of the, the shepherd of the wool, the, the sorter of the wool, the wool comber or the carter, um, the dyer, the scribbler, et cetera. Um, Smith goes on to list all of these people, but then he says, think of all the people who are involved in transporting the materials to make this, uh, to enable this to happen. Think of the blacksmith who makes, the, um, who makes uh, the scissors and the shears and the other elements that are required. And then think of all the people who are required to get those things to the blacksmith. Once you begin thinking about this, Smith says the total number of people involved in these, uh, in these um, long chains of cooperation exceeds all computation. So think for a second about your iPhone. How many people were involved in bringing your iPhone to you? It could be literally tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, almost none of whom do you know. They didn't know you. They, they come from different countries. They speak different languages. For Adam Smith, anyway, this was a celebration. But back to the point I was making here, uh, positive sum cooperation is both mutually voluntary and it's mutually beneficial. So now let me ask you two questions. Between the two, extraction and cooperation, which of them is more moral? I hope the answer to that is obvious. Um, it's cooperation, but I would point out that it hasn't always been so obvious. Um, for, in fact, throughout most of human history, the idea that you needed to ask somebody's permission before you took something from them is a relatively recent uh, development, uh, a welcome development, but a relatively recent one. But let me ask you this question. Which one leads to increasing overall prosperity? So not benefiting one person or one party at the expense of another, but rather which one leads to mutual benefit? Well, by a stroke of spectacular good luck, it's the same one. Um, it's cooperation. So that now leads me to, I wanted to talk about two sins and I um, just mentioned them briefly, um, but that leads me to economic sin number one. And that is that the idea that increasing wealth must be zero sum. Extractive exchanges, in fact, are zero sum. They could, as I mentioned, even be negative sum, but it's extractive exchanges that are zero sum, but cooperative exchanges are actually positive sum. And what happened to explain, and now we're getting to my explanation for what uh, led to that hockey stick um, rise in worldwide wealth was that attitudes began to change and then institutions followed them. So in the 17th century, um, in the 18th century, some people began to think that maybe it was not moral to simply force people to do things or to give up things, including their, their labor, their goods, their land against their will. Maybe we should ask them permission. And I uh, show you the picture there of uh, one of the great figures in British history, John Lilburn, um, who, was, who was active right before, this is during the English Civil Wars and, um, and during the period when Charles I was executed in 1649. Um, he made an argument that, um, you may know the story and I won't tell you very much about it, but if you don't know about uh, John Lilburn, you should absolutely look into him. Um, but one of the things he did was he was agitating for freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. And he was brought before the Star Chamber and John Lilburn um, shockingly snubbed the judges of the Star Chamber by refusing to bow to them. He did not bow, which was customary and demanded. Um, and when asked why he refused to bow, he said, because I'm equal in moral agency to everybody in this room, we are all equals. And so the judges are owed no deference from me. So of course for that, he was, he was pilloried, he was publicly whipped and flogged and imprisoned. His story is quite spectacular, but I mention him because he's one of the early figures in human history and also in British history to argue that we have an equality of moral agency. We are, um, and because of that, people require our permission before they are ent entitled to demand something of us. As that attitude began to change, it's and spread, it led to changing institutions, and that's what gave rise to that great upward slope of wealth that some economic historians call the great enrichment. So let me ask a quick question. Does it mean that if one person is getting wealthy, it must be at another's expense? I think that's what this economic sin is. We assume that if one person is getting wealthier, one place is getting wealthy, maybe a town, a village, a country, a region of the world, if it's getting wealthy, it must somehow be at another person's expense or another group's expense. That can be the case if it's extractive. 
But if it's cooperative, then I don't think it is the case. And the reason for that is because there is something that we might call the opt-out option. So these institutions and the morality that, un that undergirds them supports what I call the opt-out option, which is simply the right to say, no, thank you. So when I make you an offer um, for your laptop, let's say, if you don't like the offer, you can say, no, thank you, and you can go somewhere else. Well, the minute that you are allowed by legal rules, so by law, and also by our, um, our common consensus to say, no, thank you to anybody, when everyone has the right to say, no, thank you to any offer, proposal, request, demand, et cetera, then immediately, if there's something I want to get from you, the only way I can do it is to think about you. I have to think about, well, how can I give, what can I give you that you would value sufficiently to say yes? And when we do, when, when that's the case, when everybody has the opt-out option, then that fundamentally transforms our relationships so that the exchanges that we engage in are no longer extractive. They have to be cooperative. They're win-win for you and for me. But there's a third win also, and that is they generate benefit even outside of our transactions by increasing the overall prosperity for society. So the third win is society. You win, I win, and society can generate um, uh, more resources as well. One last question I'll just mention is, does that raise the prospect of there being such a thing as innocent inequality? Um, I think it does. So I give you an example that I'm sure you're all familiar with, but when you think about very great different differentials in inequality, um, and you wanna ask whether that it's moral or not, I think one of the questions that you have to figure into your evaluation of it is, well, how did the wealthier person get the wealth? Did that person get it through extraction? So through theft, fraud, confiscation, unfair dealing, et cetera? Or is it through all cooperation? In other words, mutually voluntary and mutually beneficial transactions. Whenever we wanna judge inequality, I think we have to ask that question because that's where the real moral action lies. So what's the lesson I draw? I think we should discourage extractive exchanges. I hope that's not too controversial, but I think at the same time, we want to encourage cooperative exchanges. Now, this is just a little bit of a, um, a follower from the first sin. So economic sin, number one, was to believe that wealth is always or necessarily zero sum. Economic sin 1A is that other prosperity entails my poverty. So is it possible for um, other people to generate prosperity in such a way that it doesn't mean that I'm being made worse off, even if I'm not being made better off? Well, I think that is the case. So other other people can prosper. If other people prosper through cooperation, note I said cooperation, not extraction. If other people through co uh, prosper through cooperation, then we're prospering too, even if we're not parties to the transaction. And this is a story that Adam Smith told um, a couple of centuries ago, two and a half centuries ago. Um, here's his very short uh, story of wealth. If you've heard of Adam Smith and his Wealth of Nations, the full title of that is An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. So he wanted to know what actually increased, caused wealth to increase. Well, here's his story. I'm giving you his crib sheet story. So if you want to memorize the recipe, you'll know forever. Um, he says, first, what you have to do is you have to make people secure in their persons, their property and possessions, and in their voluntary promises. In other words, um, no one may assault, enslave, or kill them. No one may take or despoil or defraud them out of their property. Um, no one, uh, and if they make a voluntary promise, they enter into a voluntary uh, contract or agreement, they're kept to it. If you have institutions that support that and a, um, and a social and cultural consensus that upholds that, then what do people do, Smith said? They begin to divide the labor to increase production. They look for ways to increase the amount of the goods or the services or whatever it is they're, they're producing. As that increases, what happens um, to the supply? The supply increases, and when what happens to the prices then? They tend to decrease. So as supply of goods and services increase, um, the, the uh, price decreases. And then as the prices decrease, and as this is repeated, this process is repeated throughout many different goods and services industries, this leads to overall rising standards of living and especially for the poor, because that means that the poor too are now enabled to, in, to attain to have access to increasingly greater amounts of goods, services, and other necessities of life. So that's Adam Smith's story. Um, but what that means, what that entails, is that other people's prosperity can mean more opportunities for me. More goods are created. 
more services are created, there's innovation, there are more op employment opportunities, which means there are more opportunities for me to sell to people, to buy from them, to partner, exchange, transact in other ways, associate with them. That means that, that there are more opportunities for me to improve my situation by at the same time improving theirs. And I can't help but uh, mention just one um, maybe you've heard of David Hume. David Hume and uh, Adam Smith were both Scotsmen and they both uh, were friends. Um, David Hume went so far as to say, and I'll quote him here, he says, I shall venture, therefore venture to acknowledge that not only as a man, but as a British subject, I pray for the flourishing commerce of Germany, Spain, Italy, and even France. <laughs> even France. Um, and why would that be? Well, um, as blasphemous as it might have seemed for someone to say, a British subject to say in the 18th century, it was because he thought this argument held true, that other people's prosperity does not entail my poverty, but on the contrary, it um, opens up greater vistas of opportunity for me as well. Okay, that's economic sin number one. Let me talk about economic sin number two. I call economic sin number two, good is not good enough. Um, uh, sorry, so to think that good is good enough is itself a sin. You remember from our discussion just a few minutes ago, we have scarce resources, which means we have to make decisions and sometimes very hard decisions. Sometimes we have to say no to things that are good ideas only because they're not as good as other ideas we might have. And part of the impetus behind that is because our desires are always outstripping our resources forever. No matter how much wealth a person has, we always want more. No matter how many resources we have, we always want more. And that seems to be um, an endemic aspect of the human condition. It doesn't go away and it entails that we just can't have it all, um, not at the same time anyway. But what that means is that a good idea is not yet good enough. So to decide, to allocate our resources in one direction or another, our scarce resources in one direction or another. Um, first of all, it has to be a good idea. That means it has to actually contribute to something that matters to us. But the fact that one kind of allocation contributes to an idea that matters to us is not by itself enough. It's necessary, but it's not by itself enough. It's not sufficient for us to actually be justified in doing it because we have to then show that it's not just a good idea, but it's better than other good ideas. That's one of the hardest things for us to do in our personal lives, um, also in our professional lives. If you're a professional, whatever walk of life you're in, I'm sure you've had many, there have been many occasions in which you've thought to yourself, I'm doing too much. How do I decide? And it's not that some of the things you're doing are necessarily bad. It could be that all of the things you're thinking about doing are good, but you have to make decisions among them and you have to make choices among them, which means trading off some against others. So a good idea is not yet good enough. Um, in order for us to do it, it has to be better than others. And I'll just mention as one historical source for this idea, Frederick Bastiat, who was a French par parliamentarian in the first half of the um, 19th century, um, very famously gave this example of the broken window. It's a, it's a simple story. He says there's a shopkeeper whose little son throws a rock through his uh, window pane in the front of the store. Um, Bastiat says that now that the son has done this, um, this uh, engaged in this destructive act, um, the shopkeeper now has to pay the glazier. Let's uh, pick a number. Let's say it's 100 pounds he has to pay for uh, replacing the window. Um, Bastiat asks, um, it seemed like it was destructive and a destructive act on behalf of uh, the shopkeeper's son, but was it actually productive? Because after all, it gave business to the glazier that the glazier didn't have before. Um, and this seen versus unseen is part of what became, has become known in economics as the broken window fallacy. Um, what's the fallacy? The fallacy is to look at only the seen aspect of the act, so giving business to the glazier. What's the unseen act? The unseen act is what would the shopkeeper have done with that money had he not been now required to pay for it for to pay for a new window? So Bastiat says, well, maybe he wanted to buy a new pair of shoes, or maybe he wanted to buy some books for his personal library. So in addition to the seen benefit to the glazier, the glazier gets 100 pounds worth of business there is also an unseen cost. And the unseen cost is the lost value to the shopkeeper of whatever was given up, the, the books um, um, or the new shoes. That's the unseen. Now here's the, uh, where uh, the rubber meets the road. 
Um, which of those is more valuable, the business to the glazier or the lost value uh, to the shopkeeper? Well, if we're thinking about the shopkeeper's perspective, he must have valued the shoes or the books higher than a new window. How do we know that? Because if he valued a new window more highly, he would have already been intending to buy a new window, but he wasn't. He only bought the window because he had it broken by his son. Then also look from the level of uh, the perspective of the society in general. Is the society better off or worse off for the uh, broken window? Well, if you think about the flow, so money is flowing, 100 pounds goes from the shopkeeper to the glazier, then the glazier spends a hot, that you know, 100 pounds somewhere else, the money flows, but what's lost is the stock. So think about the total amount of goods in the world. Um, in the one case, if the window's not broken, we have a window and a pair of shoes. But once the window is broken, all we have is a pair of shoes. So the unseen is the lost value that's often hard to imagine because it's never actually realized. It's what you would have given up. It's what, you, what would have happened, and it's what you gave up. This raises the, the question of opportunity cost. So whenever we're thinking about doing something, allocating our scarce resources of time, talent, or treasure in any particular direction, we also always have to ask, well, what am I giving up to do so? What's foregone? What is the lost value that now will not be realized because of what I'm going to do? And Bastiat asked this question, um, which I'll just pose for you. Should the government fund the arts? Um, well, before you can, you know, let's just stipulate that we all agree that the arts are a good thing. Um, the question of whether the government should fund the arts, um, in order to know whether it's a good idea, good is not by itself enough. You have to know whether it's better than other things that we would have done with, that, with those same resources. Because our resources are scarce, we have to decide and know, well, what are the various things we could do with these resources and how do they rank for us in importance? Um, and so the question of whether the government should fund the arts is, can only be answered once we've compared it to whatever else we might have done with those resources, including, I suppose, leaving them in the hands of taxpayers. What would they have done with, the, with those resources? compared the benefit from those alternative uses to this one we're considering. It's a much more harder question, but we won't be able to have um, good and wise and good enough resource, uh, uses of our resources until we've engaged in that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so I will uh, come to a conclusion of my uh, presentation. I've just talked about two of the resource, uh, two of, sorry, the economic sins that I discuss in my book. Here's a list of some of the other ones. Um, I mentioned uh, one of the uh, economic sins I talk about is the belief that there is a great mind out there, some person or persons who knows all the information about us to know what the best allocation of our own personal resources is. Um, progress is inevitable. So sometimes I think people think that no matter what policies we have or what we do, we'll still keep getting the next iPhone every six months that, uh, um, that resources will continue to increase. But as you saw from those graphs I showed you earlier, in fact, um, the growth of wealth is a relatively extremely recent um, uh, occurrence in human history. So it is absolutely not inevitable. It is dependent on having the right kinds of institutions and the right kinds of moral attitudes about those institutions. Um, economics is immoral. People think economics is immoral. Um, well. If something, think about the choices. Remember, I said that, that, that we make, that every choice we make about our resources involves trade offs. Um, well, the choices we make are going to have to be in the service of the things that actually matter to us. Well, some of the things that matter to us are our moral values. If our moral values matter to us, then they should affect the choices we make. And if they affect the choices we make, then they will also be figured into exactly the same kind of reasoning that we're engaging in when trying to decide how to allocate our resources. Those are a few others, um, whether equality of resources is something we should pursue, whether markets are perfect. The short answer on that one is no, they are not. Markets are a powerful tool, um, but that doesn't mean like any other tool, they don't apply to everything um, in the family in particular. I think it would be a terrible mistake to apply market principles to a family. Um, and then the final one, the world and I, that's the fallacy of believing that whatever the right choices are for me and my life, are therefore also the right choices for everybody else in their circumstances, that too, I think is a fallacy. So just a couple of concluding thoughts now. Um, we all want a just and humane society. This is the presumption of the book. I assume this, I don't, um, I don't argue that we ought to have a just and humane society. I believe I begin with the premise that we do, even if we mean something different by just and humane. Uh, 
We also all want increasing opportunity for increasingly many people. We want increasing uh, prosperity. The hard question, ladies and gentlemen, is how do we achieve those things? If we want a just and humane society, we want increasing opportunity and prosperity, how do we achieve them? Especially given the facts of our scarce resources of the fact or that what seems to be the fact of human nature that we are, we have self-interest, we have benevolence, but it's somewhat limited. How do we achieve those things given those facts? And I think avoiding mistakes is the very first step. So think of the, the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. I think that applies to public policy and to political economy as well. The first thing to do is to do no harm. And I think what that means is in this case, figure out what those seven deadly economic sins are and exorcise them from our economic and political thinking. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and your attention. All right, uh, Jim, thank you for that. We have a few questions in here already, okay? Great. So the first one is from Eli Harouche, and he's saying, he's asking, are you claiming that the statement that there are factual answers to the economic questions you posted are like the factual answers that there are to the scientific questions you presented? Uh, that good question. And uh, that's actually a, a, a quite a difficult question, too. So I would say that um, if it's a question like what are the likely effects of increasing the minimum wage, that's an empirical question. So I think there can be facts um, to that similar to how far is the earth from the sun. The problem with that is that it's much harder to determine exactly what those facts are. We deal more in probabilities in the economic cases than in the other in the case of how far the earth is from the sun. And the reason largely for that is that um, we can't run controlled experiments on human beings. So what we would like, the gold standard for scientific experiment is a controlled experiment, the kinds of things we do in a laboratory, say in chemistry or physics. We can't do that with human beings obviously, for obvious reasons. Um, so what we have to do is we have to look at, we have to try our best, and economists have actually become quite sophisticated at this, at um, aggregating large amounts of data across lots of large populations of people and fixing some of the variables so that they can isolate some of the other variables. Um, that is not a perfect process by any means. It depends on all sorts of factors about the quality of the data and the interactions of the data. Um, but what it can enable, I think, is us getting a probabilistic um, uh, empirical answer to those questions. So um, is it, can these sorts of things be settled once and for all? I think with all, like with all areas of human action, as opposed to say the physical world, the rest of the physical world, uh, likely not, but what we can get is uh, ever more, ever closer to uh, probabilistic certainty. Okay, Jim, the next question, Paula Klein at Anglia Ruskin University. The late American futurist engineer, Jacques Fresco, developed with his wife, Roxanne Meadows, herself a designer, a resource-based economy as an alternative to free market casino economics. The Venus Project in Florida is a vast scale model of such an alternative economy. He also pointed out the money is only, is only an agreed social contract. What are your thoughts about this alternative resource-based economy? Um, let me take the last part of that first. Um, money is an agreed social contract. I think that's, uh, that's an important insight. So if you think about you know, the bills, we use the currency, the actual paper that we use, um, why is it that a piece of paper with a certain kind of shape and a certain kind of color that it means this as opposed to something else? Um, that's by common consensus. There's no question about that. Um, so it's not as if you know there's some platonic um, essence that's in the piece of paper that actually contains the value or something. It's by common consensus. So that's certainly true. Um, and that can complicate things uh, when we're trying to think about, so you remember the long graph I showed you about the wealth produced in the world. Um, when there are currencies that are being used in different places and they mean different kinds of things, that makes it much more complicated to try to get a single standard for um, understanding all of, the, um, uh, all of the goods and services that are available in different places. So that makes it very complicated because, as you say, um, the um, currency is something like a, um, I mean, it's, not it's sometimes by law, but sometimes it's just by convention. But in, other, but in any case, it's by human convention or human consensus. Um, but what I, do, I think is not um, simply by human consensus, so just a social con construct, um, is the available resources that we have at our disposal. So the things, so the goods and services that we actually have and live on, the food, the shelter, and the clothing, those things are real things that are created by human labor. Um, and so 
they're not created in infinite supply, they are created in finite supply, and some of them can be created, um, can see increases and others of them can see decreases. And because of that, I think what that means is that um, we still have to make choices among all of these options. Um, now, if there's a resource-based economy, um, I'm not sure how much that differs from um, the kind of commercial society that say somebody like uh, Adam Smith was suggesting. Uh, but what that might mean is um, thinking about our resources in terms of, well, you know, we have a world of resources. Um, there, uh, our desires to use those resources not only outstrip the resources we have, but they also often conflict. Um, and the difference between extraction and cooperation and, and it's sort of internalizing the rules of, of cooperation, um, I think can help us adjudicate those conflicting desires. So figuring out how to use those resources is a very difficult, uh, a very difficult question, obviously. Um, and it's gonna vary from, from place to place and from person to person and from groups of people to groups of people. Um, but I would insist on this notion of, of cooperation and the opt-out option as being moral prerequisites for it so that we don't ever get to use resources that other people either own or are using without their permission. And the reason for that is because they're equal moral agents to us. All right, uh, next question. Another large thing that happened around 1700, 1800 had very little to do with extractive versus cooperative endeavors was the Industrial Revolution. I'd think this had something to do with wealth increases, given the way the nations that experienced it first saw huge GDP benefits first, even while remaining largely extractive societies. How do you control for that? Oh, it's a good question. Um, and you couldn't really tell from the graphs I was showing you because they had so many years compressed, so you couldn't quite tell. But um, I would ask, uh, would answer the question with a, a, a rhetorical question, ask you to think about this. Why didn't the Industrial Revolution happen somewhere else? Um, so suppose you'd been alive or looked at the world in the year 1000, um, so uh, 1000 years ago. Suppose you surveyed the world and asked yourself, well, um, which place is likely, given the way the world is in 1000, is likely to, to have what we would recognize or what we call an industrial revolution? Um, I think clearly the answer would have been China. China during the Song Dynasty had many of the ele elements that we think go into something like an industrial, or should go into an industrial revolution, large uh, and varied geography, um, a large um, populace that was educated and literate, um, and yet it didn't quite work. So they didn't see the increase in wealth. So let me um, go back to the Industrial Revolution. It looks as though, and I, it, it's a good question, and there are people, uh, um, econ economic historians who are you know, still trying to sort this out, but it looks as though the, um, the increase in wealth actually began slightly before what we recognize as the Industrial Revolution, and it enabled it, and then the Industrial Revolution just supercharged it. So I think the changing moral views um, including, the, I would add, the changing moral views about colonialism and the, the, the beginnings of the contestation against colonialism, slavery, et cetera. Um, I think those were the, the moral views that actually began to enable the Industrial Revolution to um, uh, where it happened, when and where it happened, which then supercharged the upward uh, trajectory. Next question. What is your perspective on quantitative easing and its effect on inflation? Raising the cost of living for the poor? Yeah, I think in the long run, it will almost certainly do that. Um, you know, it's, it, it's hard to know when um, these, uh, it will have these effects. And that goes back to the first question we had, you know, is economics really just about, um, you know, can we get settled facts about these things? It's very hard to predict, um, but um, it was, it, it was all the, going all the way back to David Hume in the 18th century. David Hume was the first person to talk about uh, what we would today recognize or call uh, quantitative easing. He said, if you, um, if you overnight, double the amount of uh, bills or the, the amount of currency in a society, does that make everybody twice as rich? Uh, the answer is no, it doesn't. Um, but what it can do is there's a lag between um, the time that the, when the currency is first created and the time it takes for it to filter throughout the entire economy. Um, and during that lag, some people can take advantage of um, the formerly, the, the prices um, that were set before the increase in the currency, which were lower, um, before the prices then rise uh, to meet the larger currency. Um, but I think what, should, what probably is likely to happen in, with quantitative easing as it continues is that prices will begin to, uh, will begin to rise. When exactly that'll happen, it's hard to say, but I think uh, I do expect it to happen. Uh, 
What is your view on Kate Rot Rayworth's donut economics model? Kate Rayworth's do donut economics model. Um, so tell me more about Kate Rayworth's donut, donut economics model. Uh, well, that's coming. Let's go to the next question then, shall we? Sure. Given the inherent inequalities in a society and the necessity of surplus labor, is capitalism extractive? Uh, um, well, I'm, I hesitate to use the word capitalism because people mean different things by that word, uh, by that word, mostly negative, but they mean different things by it. Um, and I think you'll note that I did not use that word. Um, but if we think about just say market economies more generally, um, can they be extractive? Absolutely. Um, and one of the ways they can be extractive is through one of the things that I think people sometimes mean by capitalism, not always, but I think what sometimes people when they're uh, raising criticisms of capitalism, they're thinking about cronyism or what I might call cronyism. Um, so cronyism is where you have certain favored, it can be individuals or families or companies or industries who get protections from, um, from competition, uh, who get subs subsidies, who get certain charters to trade, et cetera. Um, that's ex that, that I would put into the category of extraction rather than cooperation. Um, and so to the extent that, that those sorts of activities go on in what are otherwise called capitalist societies, then yes, I think that can be extractive. All right, uh, next question. How do you explain economics inability to correctly price scarce natural resources? Price seems to be based on current and near future, maybe up to 20 years supply and demand, but not ultimately our total supply, but not ultimate our total supply. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I, I think it's largely to, due to the, the limits of human knowledge. I think, it, I think what prices do is they reflect people's desires given the constraints they face. Um, and the constraints they face are in part the knowledge they have about the future. And the future is, our knowledge of the future is limited. So um, prices, it's very hard to know anything about what prices will be. I mean, think about the, you know, the New York Stock Exchange. What's the New York Stock Exchange gonna be tomorrow uh, let alone in a year or in 10 years or 100 years. We just don't know. Um, and there are all sorts of innovative ways that we've come up with to use resources. Um, and in fact, even decreasing over, overall worldwide, decreasing the total amount of, um, of the total use of some of our resources because of various innovative ways to get more out of less. Um, but those are very hard to predict. And so since we, it, since it, um, we can't predict them exactly, um, prices, I think, often get them wrong. But I think that's more a function of just the limitations of human knowledge. All right, next question. A common misconception of economic value is that it is determined by the labor time necessary for production, i.e. a lot of work is considered synonymous with work done well. How can we better communicate that labor is not the sole determinant of economic value? Ah, that's a hard one. Um, and um, and I, I discuss this a bit in my book, this, the labor theory of value. So the idea that the amount of labor, you, labor one puts into something determines the value of that thing. Um, if, if the question is, uh, how can we get people to see that there might be another way of understanding value? Um, I think the um, one way to think about it is that value is a two-way street. In other words, um, if, I'm making, if I'm a painter and I'm making paintings, um, I'm putting obviously a lot of my own resources, my time, my, uh, my, you know, maybe my love, my blood, sweat, and tears into my painting. Um, but the value of that is a two-way of the, my production, the painting, is a, is a two-way street in the sense that um, how much it mattered to me is evident in what I created. Um, but then there are other people as well who are going to judge it and who are going to decide whether it's worth their own scarce resources. So once you think that other people matter as much as I do, and that their choices and the preferences that they, they have, the choices they make given the constraints and the resources, the scarce resources they face, um, that their, uh, their schedule of value matters also, then that begins to suggest that, oh, well then that this, this intersection of value, I value something highly, you value it perhaps not as highly. If there's an intersection, then we can have a cooperative mutually beneficial exchange. But if there isn't, and sometimes there isn't, it doesn't mean that other people are wrong and that I'm right or I'm right, uh, I'm wrong and they're right. It just means that we're different and that sometimes happens. Next question. Surely the graph on GDP is only relevant when you use GDP as the judgment of what you're looking at 
which seems somehow blinkered, blinkered in the sense of judging wealth by money. Oh, um, yeah, so I wouldn't call it blinkered, I would call it limited. So um, does GDP tell you everything that's important about a place? Absolutely not. Does it tell you everything important about a country or even about um, uh, an individual's life? No, I mean, so the idea that you know, your moral value or the, you know, whether you've lived a life of meaning and purpose is reflected in how much money you made. No, 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 nothing like that. All the GDP, uh, so it, so the sort of larger philosophical question, does wealth equal happiness or does wealth equal a virtuous life? Absolutely not. So I want to be very clear about that. No, it doesn't. Um, what I would say is that what wealth can do is begin to enable those elements of a life that actually go into constructing a life of meaning and purpose of virtue and happiness um, in the following way. So um, if, if I don't know whether I can eat today or whether my children can eat today, well, then I'm not thinking about the greatest good in life or what college my children are going to go to or whether we can go to the family reunion next year. I'm thinking about whether we can eat today. So what wealth can do, increasing wealth can do is address our more immediate pressing concerns, food, clothing, shelter, healthcare, so that we can begin, then begin to turn our attention to these other elements of life that are not represented by or even captured by GDP or um, you know, the stock market um, portfolio. Um, the other elements that really do go into a life of meaning, purpose, virtue, and happiness. How does taxation fit into the extractive versus cooperative framework, e.g. somebody could cooperate to profit but refuse or avoid taxation? Yeah, that's a tough question. So, um, and there's, there is a variety of views about that. Um, so I, I briefly said, I talked a little bit about the institutions that are required for um, enabling wealth to grow. Um, those would be institutions that support cooperative transactions and that discourage or even punish or prohibit um, extractive transactions. So I think that in order for any society, whatever, wherever it is on the, uh, on the, uh, in the development scale, in order for it to begin to increase in prosperity, it's going to have to have public institutions that whatever else they do are punishing um, attempts at extraction. Um, and I think that means that provides at least a prima facie case in favor of generalized taxation to support those institutions. Um, now, it seems like the questioner in that case might have been thinking about taxation for other things. Um, and that takes us, I mean, depending on what those other things, I think we'd have to address that on a case by case basis. Um, so what are the other things that the taxes are going for? Um, I might re, um, just in, in a, as a general principle fall back on the uh, uh, on the point I made with uh, with Frederick Bastiat and opportunity cost. When we're thinking about um, using public subsidies or you know the, the government or the state supporting something um, out of general revenue, general taxation revenue, um, again those resources also are limited, and so they could put in be put in a variety of ways. And as anybody who pays attention to politics and the United States or in the UK or just about any other country, we'll see there's a quite a bit of disagreement about where to put those resources. Um, one element that I think economics can add to that, it, does, it doesn't determine which things we should do, but can enrich our understanding and, uh, and our evaluation of the proposals is to remember that any decision we make to put resources in one place entails that we're, that those same resources can't go to other places. So the wise judgment would be to actually imagine, well, what are the other things we might also have been able to do? What are the other likely contenders of things, the alternatives we might have uh, had with those same resources? Um, and then that puts us in a better position to be able to say and, and, and have confidence to say, okay, this is a good use of our limited resources um, because we've looked at and evaluated the other alternatives and we think this is more important. All right, Jim, let's take two. We have two more questions left, okay? Okay, great. Um, what do you think about blockchain versus fiat economy? Now changing the world economy or a temporary distraction? Well, I, uh, I think the, the, the advantages of blockchain are largely theoretical right now, although they will, um, they will quickly become practical in the sense that we're gonna find out uh, what the advantages are. But I think one of the advantages, the theoretical advantages that uh, advocates of blockchain suggest over fiat currency um, is that they are less subject to, to go back to the question we had a little earlier, um, to things like quantitative easing. So it's less 
it, it's much more difficult for anybody to inflate or deflate, uh, but to change the levels of currency um, for political reasons or for other reasons not related to um, the actual goods and services or driven by the economy itself or the level of prosperity itself. So one of the um, claimed advantages of blockchain is that it will enable a relatively constant currency, which means that exchanges from one part of the world to another part of the world or from one person to another person, one country, uh, one company to another company, um, that it can enable them to have a certain level of certainty about what the actual value of that um, of that what of the blockchain currency that's being um, that's being exchanged is, which enables people to plan a little bit more and a little bit better in the future, um, and reduces the chances of political or other machinations coming in to alter the value of the currency, say after one of the transactions has taken place. Do your seven deadly sins of economics catch, cast much light on questions around inequality? And can you give an example? Uh, yes, they do. In fact, I have an entire chapter on that. So um, um, in fact, so um, I start the chapter and I invite you to read the book. And if uh, whoever's asking that question, please let me know if you read it and if you have further questions after looking at that chapter. But um, I'll just give you, in the interest of time, I'll give you the way I begin the chapter. Um, I begin it by relying on a claim that Amartya Sen, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, Indian economist, um, who said, raised the question, equality of what? Um, and when you begin to say, when you say equality is important, immediately then you have to say, well, what kind of equality? And there's a range of different kinds of equality that actually matter. I don't, just, I don't mean things like, well, you know, are we all equally tall or something? I don't mean that. Um, do we mean equality of welfare? Do we mean equality of liberty? Equality of security? Equality of resources? Equality of wealth? If you take all of those, and there are strong arguments to be made on, on behalf of any one of those, Here's the difficult sort of political economic question. Whichever one of those you decide to champion will mean trading off against the other ones. In other words, um, if you want equality of welfare, for example, say um, the welfare in a person's life, um, for some people that might re require a great deal more monetary resources for some people and a great deal less monetary resources for others. So equality of welfare will mean inequality in wealth. Et cetera. And you can make a similar claim about the other kinds of, uh, of equality. So the first question we have to ask is what kind of equality actually matters? And then once we figure that out, we have to be, un we have to be able to make a claim and make an argument about why that equality matters more than the others. And then once we've done that, then we can begin to use, I think, the principles of economic reasoning to figure out, well, how can we best achieve that version of equality, whichever the version is that we have? And I do make an argument uh, in the book for my own preferred version, uh, but then we can begin to make an, um, we can begin to construct a plan for how to achieve or how to maximize or how to optimize, how to most um, richly get that system of um, that kind of equality um, while not expending resources on other versions of equality that we don't think are as important.